Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation, Best Practices for Securing Containers, brought to you by Sysdig. I'd like to introduce you to our presenter, Knox Anderson. Knox Anderson is a container aficionado working in product management at Sysdig, focused on security and forensic solutions for containers and microservices. Prior to joining Sysdig, he first discovered containers as an easy way to demo complex products like distributed SQL databases, and has been helping companies of all sizes make their experience of running containers and production easier. Knox holds a BS in Business Management Information Systems and Services from Boston University. And with that, Knox, I'm going to turn things over to you to begin the presentation. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, before we get started today, one housekeeping item on my side, uh, I like these sessions to be as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions um, at any point in time, please send them into the chat window. Uh, I'll, I'll view those questions as they come in and then try to address them uh, during the presentation. So it makes it more fun for me. It's more interactive for you guys and it's better than just waiting for all the QA at the end. Uh, so what are we going to talk about today? Uh, first off, let's start off with the challenges of securing microservices, move into the benefits that containers can bring uh, to your security posture within your organization, go through the different stages uh, within your container lifecycle, the best practices for securing them, a little bit of an intro on Sysdig, and then we'll get into a live demonstration of implementing some of these best practices that we've talked about. Um, so why is there all of this momentum behind containers in the first place? Uh, developers love them. There's a faster faster development process. There's easier code portability. So the first time that I was able to take something, run it in a container on my laptop, then go over, uh, move it to a micro instance on AWS, then move it to uh, an, an X3 large and have the same thing work over and over and over again, um, it was kind of magic. and this experience and a faster way to build and deploy applications uh, has made it so development teams have really latched onto containers as the way to deliver their applications. Uh, the second is operations teams uh, love containers as well. So coupling containers with an orchestrator uh, like Kubernetes or Mesos or OpenShift or things like that uh, make it easier to distribute and manage applications across uh, multiple environments. Uh, if you want to go and push out a new version of your service uh, or get something uh, like an agent on every node in your cluster, uh, you can do a daemon set, a kubectl, something like that. And now you've just affected uh, your entire environment with just a couple commands. So from an operations perspective, uh, there's a whole bunch more flexibility. There's a lot more automation. Uh, and uh, the root of this is these new container deployments. And then also uh, business units love them. So the ability to uh, couple everything from the developers with the operations makes it so that you can deliver cost-effective, innovative, and reliable products faster. So my favorite example of this, Pokemon Go, uh, when they released that service, uh, the upper limit of uh, the capacity that they thought they were gonna have to handle was 5% of what uh, they actually got in traffic in, in terms of the first month, and they were able to scale out this service, uh, deliver uh, the the functionality and the uh, SLAs that their users expected, uh, even though when they had done their capacity planning, it was 20% or, or sorry, uh, it was 20% higher than what they had expected. So. Um, all of this stuff with containers is great, but like any new technology shift, it's going to create a bunch of challenges. So uh, containers are essentially black boxes to legacy tooling. Uh, instead of going and uh, in instrumenting the hypervisor, uh, you now have to go in and see what's happening inside of this uh, really isolated black box uh, that's meant to be portable and uh, have isolation in your environment. Uh, that's great from a security perspective or from a multi-tenancy perspective, but from an instrumentation perspective, it makes it really hard to actually see what's going on inside. Uh, also, when you have a service that's now distributed across multiple nodes, multiple regions, how do you configure policy, manage vulnerabilities, 
or just get visibility uh, into the performance of that service. So instead of going in and instrumenting a, a database host, now you have to think about uh, the tens or hundreds of hosts that could make up a service. And then there's new organizational processes. So you're going to have new processes from a CI CD perspective, uh, from using new tools like uh, container registries, and then you're going to have to build new incident response and forensics uh, best practices too. So instead of just taking a node offline uh, and then going and doing your forensic analysis, you need to be more aware of the ephemeral nature of containers and make sure that you have that data to do that troubleshooting audit or forensics because more often than not, that container is going to be long gone by the time you have to go in and do these investigations. So uh, what we've really done in each one of these stages is kind of repeat our same mistakes over and over again. So from physical to virtual to cloud, uh, you're really uh, going and re-implementing monitoring, security, forensics, troubleshooting over and over and over again. Uh, and so what we've really tried to do here at Sysdig is whether you're doing monitoring uh, workflows or security workflows, the source of data is going to be the same. And so you should really think about the data first and then think about the workflows on top of that later. So uh, there's a lot of challenges that we've talked about, but um, let's talk about some of the opportunities for better security with containers. So on the deployment side, uh, your containers are isolated. Uh, they have less dependencies. There should only be one process that's starting to, that's uh, supposed to be running in those. Uh, you could also be building across a hardened base image. So the uh, deployment aspect, you're, you can uh, build these containers easier. Uh, you can pull down something that's already packaged up from Docker Hub. Uh, and then from an inventory management perspective, uh, managing the different tags and versions of a container uh, becomes a whole lot easier. It's automated uh, and can be really tied in closely with your CI CD pipeline. Uh, from a runtime perspective, that process isolation that I talked about before makes it a lot easier to lock down uh, the behavior of what those containers should be doing. Uh, also, having a smaller attack surface. So, uh, the single isolated container where you should be having uh, typical ports that that container is communicating over, uh, there's typical file activity, and all that standard behavior also is going to make it easier to baseline that container. So there's more learning opportunities and automation uh, from a policy creation perspective based on the behaviors of a container when you're running them. And then on the incident response and forensic side, there's a little bit of challenges here um, that really the organization, the uh, the whole ecosystem needs to figure out. Uh, but from an incident response and forensics, if you do have an incident, uh, it's quicker to roll back a deployment uh, to push out a new image uh, rather than going in and having uh, some patch schedule where you have two weeks to patch a critical vulnerability on a host. Uh, you can easily update that package in a container deploy that uh, new new version out and you're good to go. Uh, also, uh, with containers, it's easier to reproduce uh, events. So you can do things like committing a container to safe state, uh, pausing that container, going and quarantining it, uh, and then getting more visibility into uh, that state of the container when any event has occurred. So all these things are great um, and containers will help you uh, move to a more secure environment over time, but you have to architect your security strategy around containers and really fully embrace this technology uh, to move to this uh, more secure by design paradigm. So now let's talk about uh, some of the best practices within uh, each layer of your container lifecycle. So one of the first things uh, for securing containers is use the built-in features. So uh, containers have limits that you can apply to them where uh, you can really stop uh, resource abuse and things like that from a container going and affecting everything else that's running on that node by setting CPU and memory limits for that container. So because the container is running on top of the host OS, uh, they can go and really affect everything. So these limits are something that's built into the container runtime and it's crucial for you to set and monitor that these are set 
uh, or that a container is not consuming more than you've allocated uh, in terms of CPU share or CPU quota as that container is running. Uh, also, limit privilege. So uh, once again, containers are running on top of uh, that that host OS, and so monitor any container that is running with privilege closely, and then just try to limit privilege as much as possible. Uh, and then also uh, look at signing your images and maintaining trust uh, from the entire process from build uh, to hosting in a registry to deploying that image. Uh, there's a lot of cool projects. Uh, Graphius is one of the ones uh, that's starting to get a lot of momentum in the community here uh, to give you an API that you can hit to see uh, all the artifacts and the metadata throughout that whole trust process as the container moves throughout its lifecycle. Uh, also, scan early and scan often. So uh, containers make it easier to build in scanning at different layers of this lifecycle. And you can scan for uh, vulnerabilities. You can scan for misconfiguration. You can scan for uh, environment variables or secrets. And so building in uh, these different checkpoints that a container has to go through before it reaches production and to fail fast uh, earlier in the lifecycle is something that um, is much easier to implement in these container environments. So uh, integrating container scanning into your CI CD pipeline, then going and scanning uh, in a registry and validating uh, that scan status against an admission controller or something like that to prevent uh, vulnerable images from being deployed. And then also, uh, because it's easier to push out a new version of a container uh, or something like that, uh, also manage these vulnerabilities after they've left your uh, development pipeline and they're in production. So you know uh, if the status of anything in these containers uh, has changed from a vulnerability or risk perspective. And one of the things here is a lot of the containers that you're gonna be using are gonna be relying on open source components and fixes available uh, are pretty common here, but the attack surface of your container could be a little bit larger because you're pulling in uh, all these components from open source applications. And then uh, have good internal container hygiene. So uh, constantly rebuild images. It's really easy to uh, build these containers. So you shouldn't be uh, kind of putting a container out, running it for four months. Uh, build constantly, go cycle these containers, and as soon as you can push out a new version, do that. And uh, it'll keep your organization moving faster and then limit that exposure as well. Uh, also, use secrets management and don't bake these into the Docker file. So have some way to uh, introduce container secrets to a container uh, or build some type of IAM privileges or something like that uh, to secure the communications between these different containers. And then uh, set up a private registry. So uh, go in and uh, set up a registry where if you're pulling images from Docker Hub or if you're using any third party images, uh, put those in your own registry first so that you can validate them rather than pulling them directly uh, and putting them uh, directly into your production environment. So uh, that's, that's really before your containers uh, have hit any of this runtime and production uh, workloads. And now let's talk about some of the security practices that you'll want to implement uh, once these containers are running live in your environment. So uh, let's first talk about visibility and how to best implement uh, instrumentation so you can actually see uh, what's going on in these environments. So first, uh, from an instrumentation perspective, uh, really stay away from a sidecar or injection model. Uh, a sidecar model, you'd be having one, con one sidecar container running per container in your environment. Uh, the sad thing here is you're really getting away from uh, one of the main purposes of containers, which is to increase your capacity utilization on the node. Uh, if you're running a sidecar agent per container, uh, you're really gonna greatly increase that overhead. Uh, there's gonna be a higher attack surface and things like that. Uh, one of the other popular ways to implement uh, instrumentation with a container is to uh, do some type of LD preload, uh, preload libc libraries inside the container. And what you're effectively doing here is losing trust 
uh, in that container image. So the container image looks the same in, in your CI CD pipeline, that container image looks the same in your registry. And then right before it starts in production, you go and modify it. Uh, that really breaks a lot of these trust best practices. And so you should really think about having your instrumentation outside of that container. Also, if you're injecting something inside the container, as these come up, move around, uh, the management and getting all of that data at scale is going to be something that's very difficult. Um, from a performance perspective, uh, you should have a single point of instrumentation. So uh, staying away from these sidecar and injection models, uh, that's non-blocking. So you don't want to sit in the fast path uh, that's going in and adding a lot of latency to these containers, especially as you can hit um, really high container densities. And this is something where a year ago, if you had talked to me, I'd say we typically see uh, customers running 12 to 15 containers per host. Now that's getting closer to 20 to 25 with some customers running uh, 100 to 150 containers per host. So at that scale, uh, performance starts to get more important, especially from an instrumentation perspective. And then capture everything. So uh, getting visibility just into the container isn't enough. Uh, you need to be able to see uh, container activity, host activity, network activity, orchestrator activity. So if you're only sitting inside that container and can see everything that's coming in and out, you're going to miss everything that's going on on the host. And uh, both of those are assets that you need to be protect, protecting and detecting uh, incidents in your environment. Uh, one of the other things here, leverage the community. So uh, really before containers, there weren't as many uh, good open source options to go and implement containers or implement security in general. So one of the first things here, uh, the CIS Docker benchmarks, the CIS Kubernetes benchmarks, uh, these are open source uh, scripts that you can use to go and run uh, these checks to see if you've configured your nodes, your containers, etcd, your kube API server, things like that, following security best practices. So something that you can do on a quarterly basis, a monthly basis, a new deployment uh, to get these compliance reporting uh, to see how well you're hardening these different services in your container environments. So if you have PCI, HIPAA, uh, GDPR regulations here. These CIS benchmarks are one of the easiest, most lightweight ways to start uh, implementing security. Also, uh, Kubernetes is really trying to bake in a lot of security best practices into the orchestrator. So things like network policies, uh, where you can define how you wanna segment traffic at the service level. So really abstracting away uh, from containers and only thinking about this deployment should communicate to this deployment. Uh, network policies, pod security policies are a really good place to start here. And then admission controllers are very flexible, which allows you to define uh, what are the actual pods and containers that can start in my environment. So these are ways where you can go and have admission controllers uh, reference an internal policy that you've set up uh, go and integrate with different security tools via uh, a validating webhook to go in and check in with anything else that you're running in your environment. And uh, that gives you the options to really bake in more security by design uh, within your orchestrator. And then also uh, build depth in your open source tooling. So uh, there's your classic tools like SecComp and AppArmor. Uh, there's open source vulnerability management solutions like Anchor. And then uh, Sysdig has an open source project called Sysdig Falco, uh, which is a CNCF project around uh, a container and cloud native detection engine. So if you want to detect uh, if a user is writing below a directory, uh, if there's an unexpected outbound connect connection, these are all things that you can do with open source tooling uh, that you typically wouldn't have these options uh, and things like that that are built into the community. And then uh, also go and unify security and resource availability. So uh, monitor the container resource impact, uh, protect against abuse by monitoring these uh, container consumption and limits, the things like that, uh, that I had talked about before. Uh, you can also start set restart limits on your containers. So 
Uh, one of the things that can typically happen from both a security perspective and a monitoring troubleshooting perspective is containers crash, uh, having crash loopbacks. So um, having really intense service degradation based on a container starting over and over again. Uh, if you're setting restart limits on these containers, you'll get events. You can uh, go in and figure out uh, if that container is having an issue before it turns into some widespread uh, event across your environment. And then also uh, from both a visibility and a security perspective, uh, because you have all of these new entities in your environment, uh, it's more important to see all the service dependencies uh, and the connections between the different containers as they're moving uh, across hosts, across regions, uh, from one service to another, uh, and to go in and see if one specific container has been compromised, what are the other services uh, that could potentially be impacted? And then finishing up before we get into a little bit of the demo and SysTig, let's get into incident response and forensics. So one of the main things is just having an incident response strategy is something that uh, really you need to think about and rethink this as you move to containers. So get your teams comfortable with the different actions that they can take with a container. So if you commit a container, it's going to take a, a snapshot of the state of that image, go in and create a new uh, image of that container that you can then pull off the host, uh, run somewhere else in your environment, things like that. Uh, also look at how killing a container versus pausing a container ties in with your orchestrator uh, or different tools that you're using to schedule these containers. So in general, um, just make sure everyone uh, is comfortable with containers. You might have a couple experts within your teams uh, that then go in and move the rest of the, the team along there. Uh, also, provide container native tooling. So there's tools like SysThing Inspect, which allow you uh, to get visibility into the activity that's inside the container. Um, there's also a really awesome tool out there called CTOP. Uh, which is kind of like HTOP for your containers uh, that you can run and get more of a container-centric point of view uh, to go in and see the behavior of what's actually happening on a node in your environment right now. And then uh, build test cases and playbooks. So establish these different specialists on their incident response teams. Uh, you can go build playbooks and tools like Phantom or Demisto, or just have your own internal playbooks that says, uh, if this type of event that occurs, uh, this is the type of action we'd want to take. This is the type of data collection we need, uh, just because these are new processes. And uh, if something is already in as a playbook, chances are your organization will do a better job implementing them. And then uh, really capture everything. So um, embrace the ephemeral nature of containers. This ephemeral nature makes it easy to go in and fix an issue, uh, scale out a service, uh, go in and do a rollback. Uh, but with this ephemeral nature, you also need to uh, be prepared to preemptively collect this data. So go in and know what you're instrumenting, uh, the type of behaviors that you want to collect, detect and collect uh, before uh, you even go into this production environment. Uh, also, uh, lock down this host access. So if someone shells into a container, they can basically go and do anything on the host. So you really need to lock down the ability to do these system captures and forensic analysis remotely uh, without any entering production environments. So whether it's something where uh, you can remotely trigger this capture uh, or like in the past, you might do a, a remote TCP dump execution, building those same type of uh, workflows into this container environment are gonna be crucial. And then, uh, provide system captures to replay these incidents. So these containers are going to be gone. You need to have this data to go uh, pre and post any incident in your environment. Okay, so uh, I know I just dumped a lot of stuff on you guys there. Hopefully uh, that's helpful in terms of some of the different things that you need to think about uh, while moving to these environments. Now I'm going to go into SysDig and what SysDig is is a single unified cloud native intelligence platform to run containers and microservices in production. Uh, so what does that mean? We're gonna give you the data you need for monitoring, troubleshooting, security, and forensics for these container environments. 
So a little bit of background on the company. Uh, we are created by this guy named Loris Dejuani. Uh, he was the co-creator of a, a popular network packet analyzer called Wireshark. Sure, if there's a lot of security people and forensics people in the room, uh, you've used this tool before. Uh, a lot of the things that he used and he learned uh, while building Wireshark, uh, he brought into Sysdigger open source project. So we launched this in 2013. Uh, it's kind of like if you combined S-Trace plus TCP dump plus LSOF all together. Uh, and that core open source in instrumentation and uh, visibility is something that we built our commercial platform on top of, have 300 enterprise customers, and are really going to integrate with any uh, ecosystem partner that you're uh, using in this environment. So if it's OpenShift, Meso, Swarm, DCOS, AWS, GKE, AKS, like all the random Kubernetes services that are coming out, uh, it's just an API integration. We'll integrate with those natively and then provide the visibility you need. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our architecture. And the two main components here are container vision and service vision. Uh, container vision allows us to see everything that's happening inside your hosts, inside your containers, uh, your network traffic. And then uh, service vision is taking all of the data and the metadata from your cloud providers, your orchestrators, uh, and allowing you to get service-oriented views uh, of what's happening in your environment. The single agent uh, is sent to our backend. And so it's one agent, one backend for full monitoring, security, and forensics visibility uh, in this environment. And so what I'm gonna uh, double click down into now is uh, the container vision implementation. And what we'll do is install as a container or a process that's running on the node, and then in, uh, instrument the underlying host OS um, via eBPF, or if you're running an older version of a kernel, uh, a kernel module, this module is fully open source and is part of our open source tooling and allows us to see all the system calls that are coming uh, from any container or process that's running on the node. So from here, we can see uh, any user command that's executed, all your performance metrics. So stats, the Prometheus JMX will automatically collect. And then uh, any system event, like a file being opened, uh, a network connection, uh, a, a process being started, uh, you'll get all of this visibility into everything that's happening on a host or container from this single instrumentation point. Uh, the second component, service vision. So from a physical perspective, your environments are gonna look a lot like this on the left. We've got a bunch of different containers that are uh, scheduled across a bunch of different physical resources. What we'll do here is integrate with any of those different orchestration services to then reorient your data uh, in a way that makes sense to you. So uh, from a host based perspective, going in and saying something like, uh, I want to write a policy for my billing service that's uh, managed by this Kubernetes deployment uh, is a whole lot easier than going and saying, uh, I need to have this specific policy that's applied to this image. This image uh, is on these five different nodes. I need to have a policy per node. And thinking about setting policy or doing performance monitoring from the service perspective uh, is something that's uh, really crucial and will save your organization a lot of time uh, while implementing policy and things like that. So now I want to talk a little bit about where Cystic Secure sits. So uh, we're really going to go across the container lifecycle here, starting to integrate uh, within your CI/CD uh, platform. So scanning those images, uh, evaluating them against policies, then going into your runtime environment uh, with container vision and monitoring all that activity. And then uh, the really unique stuff is around incident response and triggering Cystic captures uh, to get full visibility into pre and post incident, uh, anything that's happened there. Across uh, this entire lifecycle, there's a bunch of different compliance metrics, dashboards, things like that, uh, that the systems are emitting. And then uh, one of the main things on the security side is you have to play well with others. So we'll integrate with uh, different SIM tools, what you're using for secrets management, RBAC, things like that, uh, from a platform perspective, uh, so that you can take the data that we're collecting and then build it into your workflows uh, in different areas of your organization.
So uh, the platform as a whole, you've got Cystic Monitor, Cystic Secure, uh, and then the top level here are the different open source projects we have. And all of these are built on top of that same instrumentation point where we're looking at these system calls uh, to get full visibility uh, into everything that's going on. All right, so uh, that's it from a slides perspective. And uh, before I get into the demo, uh, if there's any questions around uh, different instrumentation or things like that, please shoot those over. Okay, so it looks like we got one question. Um, can Sysdig get visibility into the host? So a process to process communication uh, from one host to another. Yeah, so we're not tied just to containers. Uh, if you have a policy that you'd want to configure around a given process on the node, uh, that's something that we can also do there uh, from more of your traditional like host intrusion uh, and things like that. All right, so I'm going to start off uh, in Cystic Monitor. And the thing to remember here, one agent, one backend to use Cystic Secure and Cystic Monitor separately. Uh, there's no additional work or configuration that you guys need to do. So um, one of the things, and I, I really like to show this off from a instrumentation perspective and the visibility that Container Vision provides is this topology map. So what we're looking at now are two separate Kubernetes clusters that I actually have running uh, in different multi-cloud environments. So we've got EKA, or sorry, we've got Kubernetes running on EC2 instances, and then I've got a GKE cluster right here. And what we can do is drill down into any single node, see all the different containers, all the way down to actually the process level of what's running inside the container. And why this is really important is pretty much any other tool is just gonna do something like hitting the Docker stats API. So you'll see, hey, this container is running at 90% uh, CPU, but you don't actually get to see the process that's running inside uh, and why that container is hitting those, those specific resource limits or the different activity that's coming in and out of that container. But if you're looking at uh, this environment from a physical perspective, it's gonna be really messy. Like I've got a Redis container, a Java container, uh, some Weaveworks container, this WordPress container. And so making sense of who's talking to who is really difficult. And so what we can do here is reorient this data from a logical perspective. So now I've completely abstracted away the notion of hosts and I can just see my different namespaces. So these are my logical applications that are managed by Kubernetes. I can go in here and view any specific namespace, see the different deployments, which are my different microservices, and then go into a deployment, see the different pods, go into a pod, see the container, and then the process that's actually running inside the container. And the nice thing here is you can see the different latency of the different connections, uh, how bottlenecks might be broke down, or uh, if you're having unexpected connections outside uh, of your environment, uh, which can be really useful from a PCI perspective uh, or something like that, where you need to have a topology map of your cluster and start to see if there's any connections that are going uh, outside the scope of that PCI environment. Uh, on top of the uh, different dash or the different topology maps, we'll also have uh, standard dashboards where you can go in, start to see the maps. Uh, pick up any stats, the JMX metrics, uh, see how your different services uh, are performing over time, and then things like that. Uh, the next area that's really useful from an audit perspective is this uh, explore page, which is kind of like an interactive uh, HTOP for your entire infrastructure. So you can go back to any point in time, see every entity that was running there, uh, the processes that are running inside that, that entity. I can drill down into a specific cluster, uh, then see the different nodes that are in that cluster, all of the different pods, and then see the containers that are running in that pod. Uh, but you care about those logical services, so let's move uh, over to more of a namespace-oriented view. 
And what we can start to do here is click on something like uh, this WordPress demo namespace. You'll get the overall health metrics uh, that can also be used to start to see indicators of compromise and things like that, where you can see the different request counts, uh, response times based on services. Uh, or if you just wanted to drill down and see like what ports are being communicated over across the service as a whole, you can drill down, see that data, and then go in and isolate a specific microservice and then see the typical port activity uh, for that given microservice. Uh, you can also get further into uh, connections table information here where you can see like any remote service, um, the local, and then metrics about uh, how that connection uh, is performing across your environment. So this is something hugely valuable when you're uh, configuring Kubernetes network policies and things like that. And then if you want to drill down into more of an application specific view, uh, we can automatically see that process of what's running inside a container and then start to pull things like uh, for MySQL, number of requests, number of errors, top queries, slowest queries, all automatically without you having to do any instrumentation. So from here, we'll be able to decode that TCP connection, read the file descriptor, and get this for you inside a container out of the box for free. Uh, so from an instrumentation perspective, uh, it's going to save you a lot of time. And then you're also really uh, limiting that attack surface because you're not configuring exporters or anything like that uh, on a per container basis or putting anything inside those containers. And then if you wanted to alert on the latency or um, anything like that, or the, the size of the query, uh, you can go in and create alerts and then also choose to alert on any container lifecycle events. So uh, if you're failing to pull images from the registry, uh, if you're having a Kubernetes crash loopback, things like that, uh, you can create any alerts here in this environment. And then the last thing before we switch over uh, into Sysdig Secure is uh, we have this notion of teams, which is across both Sysdig Secure and Sysdig Monitor, where you can define a team based on uh, any piece of host or container metadata. And what teams will do is limit the access uh, to data that users have in your environment. So if you have a group of developers where you only want to show them data for their given namespace, uh, put them on a team, scope it to a given namespace, and then they don't have visibility into any of the underlying host information and can just see what's relevant to their service. So from an operational perspective, it makes your life and their life a whole lot easier because they don't need to go and filter through a bunch of data that's not relevant. And then from a security perspective, they're only looking at the data that they have access to. So it's really kind of a notion of service-based access control here that you can define uh, based on what you need to do in your environment. So hopefully that was just a really quick overview of Monitor. Um, now let's hop into Sysdig Secure. And uh, the thing you need to remember here is it's one agent, one backend. So we're providing both monitoring and security from the same agent and aren't gonna add any additional uh, overhead or instrumentation in your environment. Uh, so what we're looking at now are the different uh, repositories that we've scanned. And uh, what we can do is integrate with any Docker v2 compatible registry. So Quay, Claire, ECR, GCR, all those different types of tools. And what we'll allow you to do here is scan those images, evaluate them against policies, uh, scan as part of your CI CD pipeline through a native Jenkins plugin so that you can start to implement scanning at each level of uh, your container lifecycle, like we talked about in those slides. So you can click on any uh, repo here, see the uh, scan result. Like this, this specific result has failed because there was a high vulnerability. Uh, you're going to see the breakdown of that evaluation. So there wasn't a health check in that container. Uh, that's something that we want our developers to follow that best practice. And then you can drill down further to see uh, the specific vulnerabilities, if there's a fix available, uh, the, the URL out to that given uh, report from the different vulnerability feeds uh, that we're integrating with so that you can go in and, and fix the different issues that your containers might be having. Uh, one of the other things to bring up here is the scanning engine is content driven. So we'll store all the content for a given image 
and then constantly evaluate that against uh, the, the vulnerability databases. So you don't need to do periodic rescanning of your images, uh, which is really going to slim down uh, what you need to do from an operational perspective. Uh, on the policy side, you can go in and configure policy uh, to meet those best practices within your organization. So here, like we don't want any of our containers, uh, we don't want users to SSH into our container. So we've blacklisted port 22. If that's exposed on any container, we'll want to fail that build. Uh, you can go in and say something like, if there's a critical CVE, there is a fix available. I'd like to fail that build. Uh, and a bunch of different other controls here so that you can define uh, what a secure compliant image looks like to your organization. And then uh, where I think this gets really interesting is on the runtime page. So this is taking the agent that we have running on the nodes and then comparing it to all the vulnerability scan results uh, so that you can see uh, any image that is unscanned in your environment, scanned images that have failed uh, their evaluation, and then filter this on a host by host basis uh, or go in and look at it for a namespace, for a cluster, uh, anything like that. So this is where uh, all the HTOP like view that we showed in monitor, you can do the same type of thing in secure to view the different uh, compliance status and things like that of your image. And then drill down into uh, the individual results of anything that you've clicked down into. And in this environment here, I just brought a node online recently, so there's a decent amount of uh, unscanned stuff. And then from an alerting perspective, if you want to alert uh, if a package has gone from a clean status to a failed vulnerability evaluation, uh, you can put that in there. So uh, you deployed an image a week ago into production, and uh, that image is now uh, vulnerable and that package status is updated, uh, we'll be able to do real-time alerting uh, to keep you up to date with that status of the image. So this is gonna really cover a lot of the examples that I talked about uh, in the best practices for implementing uh, the CICD and pre-deployment uh, security in your environment. Uh, so next let's hop into uh, more of the runtime workflows. And I'm going to start off with policies here and how you can write detections uh, that are uh, native to Kubernetes or native to your containers or just simple host-based detections. So we have a bunch of different uh, default policies that come from CIS benchmarks, that come from uh, Falco and the open source community or come from our container security, uh, really some of the things that we've learned from monitoring and managing millions of containers with Sysig Monitor. Um, so there's a bunch of different default policies here for like rights below a binary directory, if someone launched a privileged container, if containers have sensitive mounts. Um, but the thing that makes Sysfig really different is that service vision component. So uh, if you have a Redis image that's part of a billing service and a Redis image that's part of an auth service, you're gonna wanna have different policies that are configured to that service. So an example here is uh, we've defined for <clears throat> this Kubernetes deployment, Redis, there shouldn't be any unexpected outbound connections. And one of the easy things that you can do here is say, okay, I know a couple of different database services that I expect to never have outbound connections. And so what I can do here quickly is go in and decide to put Mongo, MySQL, also as part of this policy. And then this single policy is gonna go and scale across uh, the, the tens or hundreds of containers that can make up these different services. And then you can choose to take actions like stopping that container uh, to prevent the event from spreading, pausing it to quarantine it, or triggering the Sysfig capture. And the Sysfig capture is really similar to a PCAP file, if you've used those before, uh, but it's a SCAP file that contains all the system calls. And that'll give me full visibility into everything that's happened before the event, everything that's happened afterwards. And on a per policy basis, I can tune how much data I want to collect. So if I want to collect the 40 seconds before, the 30 seconds after, uh, you can configure this for whatever you really need uh, from an audit and compliance perspective. 
and then route this out to Slack, PagerDuty, VictorOps, OpsGenie, uh, all that type of stuff. In terms of creating the policies, you can go in and easily whitelist or blacklist processes, images. So if you have a list of trusted images in your environment, you want to detect if something's been started outside that list, you can define those here. Uh, inbound or outbound network connections, file system activity, syscall activity, uh, and all that type of stuff. And then the next section is the Falco rules. And this is where you can get really granular in the type of detections that you'd want to write. So uh, Falco is going to provide this really expressive uh, rule syntax that uh, allows you to do things like, I want to detect if a curl process is started and there's a proc TTY attached. So I want to only alert uh, on curl processes if a user is interacting with them uh, through an interactive shell. So these type of uh, detections are going to allow you to really reduce the signal to noise ratio and make it uh, pretty granular in what you want to detect from uh, a audit compliance or uh, just pure detection capability in your environment. Uh, because this is a YAML file, uh, you can manage it via Git repo, have it fully automated via APIs, and then have that full change control of every single thing that happened in your environment. So now that we've covered some of the detection stuff, let's go and get through um, some different incident response workflows and how you can uh, respond and do forensic analysis of uh, different events that have occurred in your environment. So we can look at the different events from a topology perspective. So we can see the different nodes where events have occurred. If I want to look at this from that namespace view again, I can drill down this way, go into a specific uh, namespace, see an area of my infrastructure that's had an event, and then double click down in to start drilling down into that activity. So here we can see the user spawned a shell in a container. It's your typical intrusion detection uh, for the container world. So I can click on this event to get more details. We'll give you uh, information about any commands that were executed related to that event, that forensics capture, and then you can start to also get information about the scope of uh, this event and what it's related to. So this is really important for your downstream systems where you're going to have uh, this finding surfaced against asset types of namespaces, deployments, pods, hosts, uh, containers, where traditionally you just have a finding and it's surfaced against an asset type of a host. And all of this metadata uh, is going to save your SOC analysts or anyone in your incident response team a bunch of time from having to go in and pull against Kubernetes logs and things like that. And then here we can see uh, that a shell was spawned in a container and that a user started a terminal. So from here, we can hop off, look at the commands that were executed. So a user started that shell, curled down some URL, and then untarred it and deleted their bash, bash history. So this is something where we're definitely going to want to jump in further and do that forensic analysis. And so I can jump into the captures here and see we've got this uh, SCAP file that's going to have all that data around that event. And we can open this up with uh, Sysdig Inspect, which is the interface for forensic analysis. So I can go in, see that point in time when the event occurred, and then a bunch of tiles about file activity, network activity, um, different security events, performance events, just start to overlay these strip charts to find trends in my infrastructure. So here we can easily see a trend around that specific event. Go in and just isolate the time period uh, that's related to that data. And go in here and then drill down a little bit further to actually see those executed commands. So here we can see those same commands we saw before, but then go another layer deeper and see what actually happened uh, when that tar process was executed. So if I double click on tar and then switch over to this files view, I can now see every single file that was written inside that container when that package was untarred. Um, and then because we're sitting at that kernel level, I can go in and look at any of the IO activity around a given file. So here we can see uh, the contents that were written to that file inside that container when that event occurred. And stepping back, 
this all started from a, a, a detection of a user spawning a shell in a container, uh, then going in and seeing the commands that were executed, then going in and drilling into a specific command, seeing the new files that it introduced uh, to my system inside that container, and then going actually down into the contents uh, that were written to a specific file that was introduced. And this is something that you'll have this full visibility, whether or not that container is even running on your environment anymore. So if you're having an orchestrator, chances are by the time you're doing forensic analysis, that container is long gone, and you'll have this full visibility uh, that you can go back to at any point in time uh, for your investigation. And this is something that's also really crucial from a performance and monitoring perspective. So if I want to troubleshoot like HTTP errors, uh, you're going to have all of that information uh, in these captures as well. Or if you wanted to drill down into app log messages and things like that, uh, this is all that type of visibility uh, you'll get here. And then one last thing in Sysdig Secure before uh, we open it up to Q&A is uh, going a little bit deeper into the commands audit. And uh, what I can do here is go in and look at uh, the different hosts that I have running in my environment, the commands that are executed there. I can move this out to a longer time period. So if I wanna look over the last day, uh, what were the commands that were executed? Uh, this data is something we're gonna be streaming and capturing uh, by default all the time. And you can click on uh, an individual command here, isolate a given user and then see uh, the different commands that they've executed across different nodes or different services in my infrastructure, drill into a specific uh, host here, and then go in and see something like, I want to isolate uh, any privilege execution that they've done. So this is something that you'll have uh, this full forensics and audit log of any user activity that's tied uh, to a specific user, uh, you can filter on commands, see the working directory, the PID, uh, the specific shell ID, and all that type of stuff. So from uh, a perspective of looking at this across a Kubernetes or a distributed deployment, uh, it's going to make it a lot easier to isolate activity and where it happened in your environment. All right, so um, that's what I had today for you guys from a demo perspective. And I think uh, now would be a good time to open it up uh, for Q&A. Awesome, so it looks like uh, we got one question in around, uh, does Sysfig integrate with uh, EKS and Fargate? So uh, one of the things here, uh, EKS right now is only for EC2 instances. Uh, we have a native EKS integration. It's using the same Kubernetes control plane uh, as raw Kubernetes. So we'll have uh, a native integration there. And then from a Fargate perspective, um, it depends on if you're using the Fargate managed service or uh, Fargate um, just running on those EC2 instances where uh, we can do the same type of eBPF instrumentation and then are working with Amazon on uh, different other instrumentations uh, that are that are container centric there. Another question, um, how does Sysfig integrate with Prometheus? So uh, Sysfig, what we'll do here is be able to uh, decode that Prometheus uh, protocol. So what we'll be able to see here is if you have an exporter or anything like that configured on a node, uh, we'll be able to see that exporter and then go in and automatically scrape those metrics and then tag them uh, with that environment metadata around uh, the specific cluster, the host, uh, the region, and then things like that. Great, well, thanks everyone for uh, joining the session today. Hopefully it was useful to you guys and uh, if you have any other questions uh, where you want to follow up or things like that, uh, feel free to uh, reach out to us on Twitter with at Sysdig. So uh, happy to help you guys, and hopefully everything goes well with your container journey. Great. Well, I'd like to thank Knox for a great presentation today.
I'd also like to thank today's sponsor, Sysdig, for providing the DZone audience with a great webinar presentation. And lastly, thank you to everyone who joined us for today's presentation. We hope you learned something new today that will help you in your developer career. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.